Well, good evening, everybody. I'm really glad that uh, everyone could join us tonight. So in Grand Forks, it's been a really nice day. So we are competing with the weather finally. All my snow is melted, so that's a good thing. Um, we've had uh, about four of these to date and we've had some fantastic speakers and I know that tonight is going to meet that challenge uh, readily. So we've heard from airlines, we've heard from our own faculty on kind of what's going on and what we can expect to see. And we've heard from NBAA, which is talking about business aviation and corporate with a touch of GA. And tonight we're gonna head into the airport realm. So I'm really excited to have Sean Doberstein here from the Fargo Hector International Airport. He will be followed by Jim Sweeney, who is the president of several Fargo Jet Center companies, and they're too numerous for me to understand and explain, so he will take the helm on that. And Kyle Warner, who is the current executive director of the North Dakota Aeronautics Commission. So actually, most of you probably don't understand what a state airport direct or state aviation director does. And so that'll be particularly interesting uh, as Kyle kind of shepherds you along the path of how the state is uh, dealing with COVID. So I've asked all three of them to introduce themselves uh, one at a time, kind of in short fashion, and then we'll turn it over to Sean. And he's going to talk about Fargo, and then Jim will talk about the Jet Center and Kyle will end our session tonight. If you have any questions, please type them in on the Q&A. So if you look at the bottom of your screen now, right now, underneath Kyle's name, it says Q&A. So if you have any questions that you want to ask these three at the end, we'll be more than happy to get to your questions. And so just type them in there. So next slide. First off, we're going to have Sean do a brief introduction uh, of himself. Take it away, Sean. All right. Thank you, Dr. Kenville. And thanks for everyone that, that's taken time to um, uh, tune in today for this. Um, I'm the executive director for the Municipal Airport Authority of the City of Fargo. Uh, I started my career here in Fargo in April of 1991 as the assistant director. And then when my predecessor, Joe Palmer, who was airport director for 49 years, 11 months, retired, I was interim director, appointed interim director in December of 96 and then became the executive director in January of 97. Um, I'm a North Dakota State uh, graduate um, with an undergraduate uh, degree in agricultural economics. My major was in animal science business uh, uh, with an emphasis in, uh, well, I did a lot of stuff in veterinary science, but we can get into that here in a little bit later. But uh, like I say, I've been here, just started my 30th year and um, happy to be here. Thanks, Sean. We're happy that you're here too. I know it's hard. You're you're lecturing for UND and you're an NDSU grad, but we're really glad you can come together and be with us in this setting. So thanks a bunch. Well, you're welcome. All right, Mr. Jim Sweeney, President of Fargo Jet Center. Could you give us a quick intro? Sure, thank you, Dr. Kenville. Uh, really a pleasure to be here. Thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm Jim Sweeney. I'm in Fargo and Fargo is my native town in North Dakota and uh, went from here up to the University of North Dakota and I don't have a degree in aviation, but my business degree from the university um, has been beneficial uh, in the years of experience. Uh, started uh, in, the, in the business, uh, I was in the commercial insurance industry, vowed I would never live in North Dakota again after graduation and came back here uh, more than 25 years ago and joined Pat Sweeney, my brother, at our company called Weather Modification, which is a, a legacy North Dakota company of almost 60 years. And we started uh, our FBO, our fixed base operation companies here in Fargo 25 years ago and co-founded the Fargo Jet Center and have been involved in uh, the aviation and the FBO industry ever since. I still have a role at uh, Weather Modification, very significant in some of those operations. And I'll talk more about that, but I'm excited to be here. Um, we'll share with you some of the lessons I've learned in the aviation industry and give you an update on where we're at today. Thanks, Jim, I appreciate it. I'm really glad you aren't like actually standing on the wing of that airplane. I'd, I'd be really worried from a safety perspective. <laughs> All right, uh, Kyle Warner from the North Dakota Aeronautics Commission. Well, thanks, Dr. Kenville. Uh, it's just a privilege to be here with everybody as well. Um, 
a little bit about myself, born and raised in North Dakota. I'm also a University of North Dakota uh, alumni. I graduated from the air traffic control and the airport management program and received my pilot's license up at the University of North Dakota. Um, and uh, I've been now at the uh, at the Aeronautics Commission at the state of North Dakota level for a little over nine years. I was an airport planner for uh, a little over three and a half to four years and uh, was eventually promoted to be the director for the state aeronautics commission and so uh, it's a privilege to be here i'm excited to talk more about uh, what the aeronautics commission does and uh, our work in the state of north dakota to help uh, build aviation in our state and around the country and um, um excited to be here thank you dr kendall all right so you've met our speakers tonight uh, beth is going to be so kind as to advance our slides so you can hit next slide so when the speakers want to move on, just let us know. Next slide. And I'm going to turn it over to Sean Doberstein from the Fargo Airport. All right. Thanks, Kim. Well, in my current position, um, uh, my pathway to get here was, was somewhat unique. Um, I'm a, a native of Wheaton, Minnesota, which is just south of Moorhead on the, the Minnesota-South Dakota border. Uh, I grew up on a farm out by Herman, Minnesota. That was actually our address. So I grew up as a farm kid, ranch kid, uh, cattle, horses, hogs. And, and so forth. And um, as I said, I went to North Dakota State uh, with an idea of maybe someday becoming a veterinarian, looking at going to Iowa State or Kansas State in, in veterinary science. But um, that path changed uh, about the time that um, I would be eligible to go to veterinary school. And I um, uh, was involved in track and cross country, doing a lot of running around the country and marathons and doing things of that nature. A little bit of time with the band on the road for, for a little bit and uh, got married and um, uh, got some kids and then uh, decided that it was time to look for a job. So my, my career path started um, with the city of Fargo in the street department uh, that grew into a public works analyst position back in the, the mid 1980s and uh, worked there uh, for former Mayor Dennis Wallacher when he was public works director for a number of years doing things that were completely outside of, of veterinary science or anything of that nature maybe even going back to the farm and, and, and helping on the family farm and um, uh, because I'd taken computer classes and um, had done uh, some things with, with business and so forth, I uh, started uh, working on the first personal computer that the city of Fargo had purchased back in about 1986 time frame and set up uh, all kinds of cost accounting programs, payroll, uh, and other maintenance types uh, uh, programs for historical purposes for street pavement maintenance and so forth uh, with a program called like Lotus 123, which is now like Excel. Uh, working on DBase 3, uh, another program, and created some databases for them. Uh, so that position continued there for some time, but, but along that time, in about uh, 1988 or so, a professor at NDSU that had had, Dr. Jim Tilton, had called and had an opportunity and a suggestion for me to go back and get my master's in reproductive physiology. He was a swine researcher, so I'd be working with hogs. <laughs> And uh, that didn't quite interest me, uh, married, like you say, and a couple of kids. But I decided to go back to school and get my master's in business administration, you know, working full time and, and working on an MBA at NDSU. And um, uh, was doing that, uh, taking night classes, uh, you know, two or three classes a, a, a quarter. They were on quarter system at that time versus semesters. And um, attained my MBA. But in the fall of 19. 90, a position was posted uh, for an assistant airport director. And at that time, the country was going through the Gulf War, and a lot of things changed with the Federal Aviation Administration, who at that time was in charge of airport security. And uh, airports were required to get an airport security coordinator. Uh, Fargo Airport at that time was looking for somebody that had a business background uh, to help with accounting and, and things of that nature. So uh, I was nearing the end of my master's program and decided to apply for the position. And um, having thought that I was going to get involved in some type of an agricultural type uh, profession uh, with Pfizer genetics or others, uh, this airport opportunity came along and I had no idea whatsoever that I'd be involved in the aviation industry. I'd always love to fly and be around airplanes and so forth, but, but the thought of ever working at an airport just was, was beyond anything that I'd ever thought of uh, up until that point. So I'd applied, uh, was selected for the position. I started here April 1st of 1991. So I left the city of Fargo, came out to the Municipal Airport Authority. We are an airport authority form of governance uh, and we're classified as a non-hub airport. And uh, like I say, I'd worked for Joe Palmer as his assistant director from April of 91 through December of 96 and then uh, became director. 
So I guess the message in that is, is uh, one never knows what path uh, you're going to take um, uh, in, in my situation uh, from agriculture into to an airport uh, was something I just ne had never ever thought of. But um, if you want to go to the next slide there, that, that would be fine. Uh, what you see there, that is uh, Fargo Sector International Airport. Um, like I say, we are classified by the FAA as a non-hub commercial service airport. We own approximately 3,000 acres. So from the bottom of the screen, that would be north. As you can see, the compass heading 36 on the runway, that, that would be looking to the north. Uh, just to orientate yourself, off to the left, uh, kind of mid airfield is the passenger terminal area. To the north of that, you can see a small space of concrete to the left of the west parallel taxiway. That is our cargo area. And this summer, we will be expanding that area as far to the west as we can up to the county drain to accommodate United Parcel Service. And we'll talk about them here in a little bit as well that's moving a cargo jet operation here to Fargo. Just a little bit north of that is uh, some uh, North Dakota National Guard facilities that are here on the airfield. And they're also in the process of building about a 30 some million dollar operational readiness center off to the west, the far northwest corner there, just south of where you see the water um, out in that area there. That should hopefully be open here in the next year. If you look on the top right, that is where Fargo Jet Center is, uh, uh, actually a world uh, renowned. We're, we're so delighted to have Fargo Jet Center here. They are recognized around the world as one of the top uh, aviation service providers in the world. And uh, we're, we're really fortunate to have Jim and, and his team here on the airfield. Um, kind of the mid area of the airport to, to the left there, um, you can see our aircraft rescue and firefighting station just off of the East Parallel Taxiway. But that is property that we lease to the North Dakota Air National Guard. And um, we're, we're home to the Happy Hooligans, the 119th wing of the North Dakota Air National Guard. They currently operate the MQ-9 Reaper, which is a remotely piloted aircraft. In the military, they call it an RPA. And um, they're, they're piloting uh, RPAs or MQ-9s someplace in the world 24-7 from Fargo. And they have two stations here in Fargo, and they're doing that, uh, fighting the war on terror and other things that are happening. In addition, uh, they have two um, MQ-9 Reapers based here in Fargo. They do operate in the pattern with general and commercial aviation um, almost on a daily basis. We're one of two airports in the United States that has that activity taking place right now in terms of military aircraft in the pattern with commercial service air, um, aircraft. Uh, Syracuse, New York is, is the other one. In addition, the Air National Guard also uh, operates an intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance uh, group here in Fargo. Uh, and that, that has uh, been a pretty popular place for them to recruit other people into the Air National Guard here in Fargo. We're also home to, um, if you look in the bottom right, uh, there is a North Dakota Army National Guard UH-60 Black Hawk helicopter contingent here along with some UH-72 Lakota helicopters. That's what we call our South General Aviation Area. That is currently where UPS is operating their cargo operation right now on a, on a temporary basis. So in all, um, like you say, we have a great relationship with the North Dakota National Guard and we look forward to many more years with them. Next slide, please. Uh, what you're looking at there is our passenger terminal. The original portion was constructed in 19, uh, opened in 1986. We did an addition off to, to the left or to the west of that to add one more gate and some more baggage carousel areas. That was done and um, completed in 2008. And you can see all of the parking lot that's out there. I wish it looked like that today, but unfortunately it doesn't. It's, it's pretty much vacant and we'll talk about the COVID situation here in a while as well. Off to the left, you can see a, a kind of a circular road that's a fuel farm that's owned by Fargo Jet Center and just to the north of that is our current maintenance shop. The grass area that's in between the fuel farm that's off to the left there in that maintenance shop, we just awarded bids to construct a new uh, snow removal equipment storage building that will be constructed in that area starting here in the next month. Hopefully it will be completed in about a year. Uh, to the north, uh, the building, the long building with all the open doors, that's our car rental service facility. And then the uh, overflow lot is to the north. So this picture was taken obviously at a very busy time at the airport because the overflow lot is, is basically empty up there on the top, top left. Uh, uh, we are in, we're in conversations uh, prior to the COVID downturn to add on to our terminal building off to, to the right, I guess, of, of the, the building there right now to the east. We were looking at adding space uh, to, a, uh, to add four gates. We have currently have five gates right now. Uh, we believe we have the justification to add on space to add four additional boarding bridge gates in that area because of, of the activity that, that's taking place. That project might be on hold for right now, uh, but we do have to complete a terminal study to try and justify uh, going through that. Uh, next slide, please. 
Okay, that's our current uh, route map right now, five airlines to 11 destinations. Some of those destinations are seasonal. You can see American Airlines with service to Dallas, Fort Worth and Chicago. You've got United with service to Denver and Chicago. Frontier with seasonal service in the Phoenix, Sky Harbor and Denver. Uh, Allegiant that has seasonal service either to Orlando, uh, Phoenix Mesa, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, and then a new market that they'll start here in June, which will be Nashville. And then Delta Airlines with service into Minneapolis, St. Paul, and then seasonal service down to Atlanta. And we hope to maintain that uh, route map uh, as this COVID situation uh, uh, um, hopefully gets better here in the not too distant future. But that's the current route map. Next slide, please. Uh, let's see one back. So in plane passengers, you can see our growth from 2000 through 2019. That was a record year uh, for us, 2019. And, and all indications were from, from that point, uh, basically from 2017 on, as we, we continue to have record month after record month. And uh, January uh, traffic of 2020 over 2019 was up 18%. February was an all-time record month, almost 45,000 passengers uh, in plane here in Fargo, another record month. Uh, doing extremely well, uh, up, like I say, 18% year over year, and then COVID hit. And uh, you can see that, uh, you know, we're expecting a dramatic drop right now. We're down 95% uh, year over year in, in, in terms of uh, with the COVID situation that, that's impacting us right now. Um, if you look at the TSA statistics nationwide, there was a day here just, uh, just a few days ago where nationwide they screened 90,000 passengers and on the same day, one year prior was over 2.4 million people. 90,000 passengers is not even what they put through LAX in, in one day. So um, you can see traffic is, is down significantly. Next slide, please. Uh, these are some charts here that show the blue line at the top is the, the uh, number of seats that were scheduled in our market uh, through March of 2020. And you can see uh, in the yellow line right below that, or the gold line, the number of passengers uh, that actually flew. So we had X number of seats. We would typically fill anywhere from about 88 to 95% of those seats month over month. March was going to be a record month for us in terms of the number of seats offered, which was over 61,000 in the market. And we were on, on uh, track to fill, uh, have over 50,000 passengers in the month of March, which would have been the first time that we would have broken the 50,000 uh, employment mark for, for a month. Uh, things were doing extremely well. Um, so you can see in the green seats, uh, seats scheduled pre-COVID and then the number of seats that we have in the market right now, you can see a significant drop. Now, on the, towards the right of the screen, you can kind of see where it's, there's some optimism with the airlines as far as seats coming back to almost what was scheduled prior to COVID. But uh, to tell you the truth, things are changing not only on a, a daily basis, but basically hourly. I can see a flight uh, that would be scheduled at five o'clock when I would leave tonight, and by 11 o'clock at night, it would be canceled or would be in the next morning. So our schedules are completely fluid right now in terms of what's happening. Where we would have 22 to 26 flights a day, depending on the, uh, the season or when Allegiant was operating or Frontier, right now uh, through the Department of Transportation, the airlines were required to operate 19 flights per week into Fargo. Now Frontier filed uh, uh, an amendment to the order from the DOT and they were granted uh, relief from that. And uh, right now Frontier has suspended service in 33 markets through June 10th. And Frontier is one of our carriers that was supposed to be back in operation to Denver uh, back in, uh, on April 6th, but that has been suspended. I spoke with Allegiant today, uh, this afternoon, uh, Las Vegas service is uh, suspended indefinitely and Orlando service is suspended indefinitely. And it sounds like Disney may not open until 2021. Las Vegas time will tell when that will recover. So there's a lot of things that are happening with the carriers uh, every day as they're making decisions on how future schedules will, will be put together. But like I say, we're hopeful that uh, hopefully at some point in the future, things will come back. Next slide, please. Okay, we're home to two major air cargo companies. Uh, we were fortunate that FedEx uh, commenced service here about uh, three years ago. And then uh, we were fortunate that UPS uh, commenced service here on November 1st, just over a year ago. So all of the cargo that is flown throughout the entire state of North Dakota, West Central and Northwest Minnesota, and even portions of Northeast South Dakota, those jets carry that cargo here and then it's dispersed out either by truck or by a feeder aircraft for the entire state. So if you order something in Dunseith uh, on Amazon today, it has to come through Fargo to get to you. And uh, 
uh, they're doing extremely well. That business uh, hasn't slowed down really by much. Some of the feeder aircraft have gone away to points throughout uh, North Dakota because of volumes, but really uh, that's what's really keeping us going at this point right now is, is the full cargo schedules with UPS and FedEx, and uh, we're really hopeful for that. Next slide, please. You can see the growth in cargo. Um, let's see, back one. So in 2015, and these are in thousands. So when the Federal Aviation Administration looks at uh, uh, cargo across the country, it's based upon the landed weight of the aircraft. It doesn't have anything to do with what is carried on the aircraft. Uh, it could be empty, but the landed weight of the aircraft, that's what we track in order to get access to air cargo entitlement funds. And for this year, we qualify for about $120,000. You can see that I believe we had about 391 million tons of, of landed weight of air cargo, or 391 million pounds of landed weight of aircraft that were just carrying cargo. So that's, that's been a big growth area for us. It's probably about 300 jobs uh, that are created in the community because of FedEx and UPS here in, in the market. And we look for additional growth with them uh, as the community grows, the region and, and things, uh, industries across the state, this entire region grow as well. Next slide, please. Okay, I guess if you have any questions there. The one thing that we'll move on to here is, um, you know, what we're doing right now as an airport to uh, counter COVID. And uh, we haven't laid off any staff. I have 26 full-time employees and some part-time employees, some seasonal, some that are here just when uh, it snows and then they uh, transition out here in the next few weeks. And then we have some that come on board uh, just as, um, uh, we get into the mowing season to cover vacation coverage for our full-time employees. But of the 26, we have 10 that are aircraft rescue and firefighters. Uh, and then the rest of us, like I said, are split between airfield maintenance and building maintenance. Um, and in the COVID situation, we have no plans to lay anybody off or to keep everyone employed. Um, what things have changed for us is airports and our staff, we've been disinfecting airports for years. In all the years that I've been here, we always clean the bathrooms, the high touch areas and so forth. So there really isn't anything new that we've done because of COVID or SARS before or Ebola or any of the other pandemics that we've had. But what we are doing is we're increasing, increasing the tempo of cleaning those surfaces. So instead of maybe getting two or three touches a day, they might be getting six to 10 touches a day. Any place where the traveling public is going and touching things and doing things, uh, we've increased the tempo of that cleaning. Uh, but outside of that, for our airfield staff, really nothing has changed. We're doing our social distancing, uh, being careful with those things. They have the options of wearing masks if they would like, follow all the CDC guidelines. Uh, from that nature and, and like I say, working with our tenants. Uh, as you can see, there's lots of virtual meetings that are taking place as opposed to uh, in person, but yet our badging office is still open. Uh, it, it's somewhat busy because of the hiring that UPS and FedEx have done to keep the cargo going. And there are transitions with some of the uh, carriers uh, here in the building with their ground service companies as well as employees come and go. So we're still badging people. We're still coming to the office every day, keeping our distance. We have a large enough office to, to stay safe in that, that fashion. As far as passengers, like I say, uh, uh, they're few and far between. You know, uh, uh, if we get 100 passengers a day or even 150, that, that, that's kind of a blessing because we're really down to anywhere from four to six flights a day, depending on the day of operation, if Allegiant's operating or not. So American's been very consistent with Dallas and Chicago service. Uh, United's basically down to one operation a day to Chicago and one to Denver. And then Dallas, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Delta service into Minneapolis is, is one to three flights a day, depending on, on the day of the week. And Allegiant pretty much right now is one to two flights a week from, uh, from Mesa. And like I say, Frontier suspended service until uh, June 10th. And we'll get an update from them here in the not too distant future. But you know, we, we've dealt with uh, situations before. We've had downturns, obviously 9-11 was, was kind of a big deal for, for a lot of airports where all air service was suspended. Uh, we recovered from that. Uh, there were things that we could do as a country to show the traveling public that measures were, were taken to, to, uh, to address the safety and security concerns that they had. We had physical armed guards at the checkpoints, uh, people, uh, you know, government employees were going through uh, check-in luggage and, and carry-on luggage and so forth. So you were demonstrating that actions were being taken. How to come through this COVID thing with something that's invisible and nobody knows about it is really going to be a challenge. Um, how do we demonstrate to the traveling public that it is safe to fly again and travel about the country and about the world for that matter with, uh, with a virus that you don't know if you've had it or if you don't have it or you're asystematic and there's a lot of uncertainty and questions out there. So it may take some time for the traveling public to come back, but I'm optimistic that we'll start to see that happening this fall. I was on a call yesterday and Delta had 
as of yesterday was predicting that 50% of the traffic that they carried for Christmas of 2019 will be in place for Christmas of 2020. So they're looking at carrying 50% of that traffic uh, this coming Christmas, uh, as opposed to what they carried back in, in 2019. So I thought that was a pretty optimistic uh, uh, projection on Delta's part from, from that aspect. But, um, you know, the passenger um, sector right now, the aviation industry is in, in great turmoil, but I believe it's going to eventually turn around. How long eventually is uh, really is a pure guess by anyone at this point. Uh, the U.S. economy, I believe, will rebound um, and it will rebuild, but it may be different than what it was pre-COVID-19. Business activity will regain momentum as the pandemic, pandemic uh, situation improves. I think the job outlook appears uh, bleak at this time, as you're aware, millions of, of people around the country are, are looking, are out of a job looking for employment. But I believe that this will rebound as the business sector carefully reopens under the CDC guidelines around the country. And you know, the advice for some of the students is, is I believe that your resumes will need to adjust to the job opportunities that, that develop. Your resume needs to be flexible. Uh, you might need to start in a completely different industry than move to the right aviation job when that opportunity presents itself. Uh, I think there'll be a number of startup companies uh, that will present opportunities as a result of the pandemic. And um, you know, the traditional path for airport job opportunities might be frozen at this time for a number of airports, but Others are in what I call the chilled hiring uh, situation because there's still going to be retirements. There's still going to be things that are going to be taking place. So I think there always are going to be opportunities for, for at airports across the country and the aviation industry across the country, especially for entry level operations. Uh, FAR Part 139 certainly isn't going to go away and airports need people in these positions. So what I would do is continue to monitor uh, for aviation related opportunities. I would continue to follow developments within the airport and aviation industry. I keep on top of current trends and changes in regulations. And if you stay engaged with what is happening in the industry, I believe it will help you when that job interview is offered to you for something that interests you at an airport somewhere in the country. And one other thing, I guess in closing here is, I, I saw an article here not too long ago from Dr. Marsha Morris. Marsha is uh, employed at the University of Florida. And she published an article uh, with advice on how to cope during the COVID-19 uh, situation. And it was really was targeted at college students. And she suggested four main themes in her article. The first was, is you need structure. So the advice was to maintain your structure in terms of a routine, get your rest, do your work, and uh, create times, uh, you know, for, for leisure time. So keep some structure in, in what you're doing each day. The second piece of advice was, it was your health. You know, take care of yourself, get enough sleep, eat well and exercise. Social distancing is important right now, but, but, but take care of your, your, yourself and, and the health. The third item that she suggested was, was happiness. You know, engage with your parents, grandparents, older friends, and others to learn about how they coped with previous difficulties in their lifetime, similar to what the current situation is that we're dealing with right now with COVID. And, and find out how did, how did they cope with that and how they're coping with the current pandemic. Um, you can always call a friend, read, do crafts, um, do something that, that interests you, um, binge watch on your uh, movies or miniseries that you are. But, you know, one thing was to stay happy. And the final thing that she had in the theme was, was hope. Hope is not just believing things that will get better. It's, it's taking action to make sure that uh, it, it actually happens and you make that happen. Self-care and keeping up with classes are part of what keeps hope alive. But time to pause and examine how you can prioritize things is what really matters. So... So if you have any advice for you, just hang in there. Uh, things will get better. And uh, we'll all be optimistic that uh, as we get through this, we'll, we'll be better, stronger for that. So uh, if there, I can take any questions that you have, or Kim, we can certainly move on. Well, Sean, I think that we're going to move on to Jim. Um, and I thank you. I think that is four fantastic pieces of advice. I was just thinking to myself, if I'm doing all four of those, and I probably need to get better at a couple of them. I actually miss walking to class every day from my office because it was part of my exercise <laughs> regime. Um, but yeah, just, just getting out and about. So I, I really appreciate you being with us and you're gonna hang tight for questions. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Jim Sweeney from the Fargo Jet Center who's been changing his background. <laughs> um, and so that is awesome because I think he'll probably talk about each and every one of those as part of his conversation. So Mr. Sweeney. Thank you. Hey, thanks again everybody for being here. and sticking around uh, uh i guess in california might be a little bit earlier hour but uh appreciate everyone tuning in and those that might watch this in the future i'm gonna give you a little bit of background on our company what we do and how we've grown that here to be based in north dakota 
and talk about some of the trends that we're seeing since the crisis and the COVID uh, of the past 30 to 40 days, and then uh, talk a little bit about what we're, we're doing to address those things and hopefully give you a couple pieces of, of advice, as Sean just mentioned, about how we've been through these things in the past, and there really is uh, optimism for the future. So uh, the next slide. Uh, our company uh, started uh, back in Bowman, North Dakota, and uh, we won't go in, into that today, but our company called Weather Modification International uh, started there, and that picture in the upper left is a fleet of brand new Piper Twin Comanches that were purchased in the 1960s and 70s. Um, those were used in seeding clouds in Western North Dakota and Western South Dakota at the time, actually a large part of both states. And so Pat Sweeney, my brother and business partner, joined that company while he was a student at the University of North Dakota. Uh, he learned to fly at UND and uh, even took check rides with John Odegaard. Um, and upon graduation, went to work full-time at, at Weather Modification. He was there several years uh, and was had become an owner of the company and was buying out the remaining shareholders uh, back in the early 90s. And I had already graduated from school. I had been living out on the East Coast and back in Minneapolis. And we started talking and he convinced me and made sense that it made sense to come back to North Dakota. So moved to Bismarck and we were there for a short time, had operations in both Bismarck and Bowman. And we decided that it made sense to get everything under one roof for that company and looked at a lot of different places to do that. And Fargo is our hometown, but Fargo made sense for a number of other reasons. It was in North Dakota, it was an international airport, and it had a progressive airport authority. Um, and that made a big difference in, in what we were doing back then, 25 plus years ago, and it certainly affected what we do here today. So a couple of the other pictures you're looking at there with the blue arrow uh, is the building I'm standing in right now in Fargo. And we started construction and moved into that and opened the doors for both weather modification. And we started and co-founded the Fargo Jet Center, our aviation services company, or as you all know in the aviation world, an FBO. Um, interestingly, and I won't talk too much about that tonight, but the uh, white building, larger white hangar in that upper right-hand corner picture uh, was our competition. So we were both under construction, exact same time. We opened up just a few months before they did. So we had two very competitive aviation service companies at a relatively small airport in North Dakota. The lower left uh, picture is the, those same buildings with several expansions over the past 25 years. Um, our total footprint today, we have more than 200,000 square feet of hangar space. Um, and our total organization with our companies and locations have uh, exceeded 200 employees. And we own and operate about 40 aircraft. And those, that includes our FBO operations where we have a flight school, uh, charter business, and then um, several weather modification aircraft that are operated around the world. Fourth picture is Premier Jet Center. Uh, we purchased that in 2014, and that's our operation at the Flying Cloud Airport in Eden Prairie, one of the suburbs of Minneapolis, Minnesota. So we have a team down there uh, that services general aviation at that airport. Next slide. Uh, we have uh, many different services that we provide out of Fargo and Minneapolis uh, in Eden Prairie. Uh, including our aircraft charter and management. Let me talk a little bit more about that and how things have changed in the past 40 days. Uh, we have an aircraft sales division called Exclusive Aviation, that logo you see at the bottom of the page. Five professionals, uh, mainly UND graduates, that buy and sell airplanes for us and our clients all over the world. Uh, we operate a flight school here in Fargo, in addition to fueling aircraft, housing them, and a large maintenance and avionics division here. And we have a really skilled and talented group of people that do paint and custom interiors uh, at our Minneapolis location. Part of the great, one of the great assets we have here in Fargo at Hector International Airport, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but our US Customs and Border Protection is one of the key services and their, their physical location where they clear aircraft entering into the United States is literally, um, set between our hangar buildings. So it's literally part of our campus, owned and operated 
by the authority, by the airport authority and operated by US Customs and Border Protection. And that's been a great asset for us to have right in our location. Go ahead. I'm gonna talk about a few of the, the declines that we've seen and each one of these talks a little bit about uh, different things as Sean talks about passenger seats that are people departing an airport. Uh, we're always interested in the number of flights, and then we'll talk more detail about the gallons of fuel that those flights take, which is a very important part of our business. So this is just a snapshot to give you a picture of, um, you know, about 40 days, essentially, or 50 days uh, this year versus last year. And you can see, and this is all flights in the United States uh, for a given month. There's typically 1.4 million in the past month or so. There's been a decline of about 51% of that, as we all know. Um, we took a snapshot of one day on April 20th, again, for the entire country, pretty significant drop in the amount of traffic flying across the United States. Next. Uh, in general aviation specifically, and th these would be anything that are non-airline commercial and non-freight. And so we, you know, a, a not non-scheduled type of operation and same thing again, 64% decline in the, in the period from last year to this year. And interestingly, um, again, looking at a snap, snapshot of a day, um, and any days, you know, days of the week are always different. Certain days get busier, but again, down about 45%. So think about that as uh, a, a business taking that type of hit and the type of volume that you're doing. Uh, is really significant. Next. So if we look specifically at Fargo, <clears throat> and again, these are all flights, um, including all the freight, all the airline and general aviation. Uh, for that same snapshot last year compared to this year, down about 43%. And then we looked at that one day, just a couple days ago, um, and we we're down 77%. So the good news is in Fargo, as Sean mentioned, we've got some great freight operations having both major freight companies uh, conducting business is extremely helpful to us right now. We didn't have that many years ago and we're very fortunate to have both of those operations continuing. Next. Uh, general aviation, uh, taking a pretty big hit when we think of our 80 plus tenants that we have that base their aircraft with us here in our hangars of all size aircraft, um, nobody's moving. It's really rare to see those people come or go. Um, it's been very limited traffic. So we're really counting on what we call our transient traffic of those aircraft that are just stopping here for fuel or coming to Fargo for one reason or another. So same thing looking at, at last year over this year in that time period, General aviation flights are way down 79%. And we looked at that snapshot of a day and again, holding only 50% of the traffic that we experienced. Next. Uh, this would be a pretty typical picture. Uh, happens to be the one in my background also of, of what our ramp would look like on a given day. We'll, uh, every day is different. That's a really fun part about our business and in any given time, depending upon what's going on in, in the region or events here in town, we're also very fortunate to um, go after a lot of international traffic because of being an international airport and having our 24-hour availability of customs and immigration clearance. Aircraft can enter the United States here in Fargo 24 hours a day. So that's been a, a great boost to our traffic. We had more than 700 aircraft last year enter the United States here at our airport and specifically right in front of the Fargo Jet Center because of customs office location. The next slide shows uh, what the ramp looked like this morning. That picture was taken earlier today and very limited traffic. Um, I noticed late this afternoon, we had a Gulfstream come through. Uh, I wasn't able to check to see if, how much fuel they bought, but I trust they did, I hope they did, because um, that's really critical to um, making, you know, making revenue and, and trying to make some money right now uh, or not lose as much money during this critical time period. Next. So uh, as Sean looked at, you know, the flights and the traffic going down, um, 
through uh, April 15th, when we looked at these numbers a few days ago or last week, uh, total gallons were only down 2%, which really surprised me. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about why we're fortunate in that regard. And then uh, looking at just April, um, you can see that that number is way down. And we think by the end of April, that 58% decline um, in flights will be even lower. So uh, I'm sorry, these are gallons of, of gallons pumped will be obviously lower by the end of this month. Next. So if we look at just the general aviation gallons pumped, um, I was surprised when we started looking at this that for April, we're only down 14%. And so we dug into that and looked at it and thought, how can we do that if, you know, month is half over, it's been very limited traffic, uh, what's going on here? And we dug in and looked at, that we're very fortunate that we've had uh, a couple of customers, one in particular that have been in and out doing a lot of routine flying, long range, a wide body, large general aviation aircraft. And they've been stopping through here and buying their fuel. And those few stops that they've made have made a big difference. Um, and again, I, uh, next slide, and I'll talk a little bit more why we think this is happening. And one of the big benefits there, and I have to give credit to um, Sean Doverstein. Sean and I, within a matter of a couple of years, we started um, working at the Fargo Airport. A similar time, we both spent 25 plus years here. And the collaboration that we have at this airport, I consider to be very unique. Um, we all deal with people at different airports across the country in all aspects of our business and relationship. Um, and we've got a great uh, environment here. And I give Sean and his airport authority, which he reports to and really make the high-end decisions on running this airport. Combine that with the air traffic control people, the US customs people that I mentioned, um, all the people, the aircraft facilities people that keep all the nav aids and everything's working, and then our talented and dedicated team here at the Fargo Jet Center. All of that comes together to make an environment that's most important at these times uh, when you can really count on each other to continue the business and make it run. I mentioned that client, we dug a little deeper into who's buying that fuel in the past several weeks, and we find out that it's an organization that We've had, as a customer for a number of years, we've done some air ambulance medical interiors for them. And in the past 30 days, they've been through on 10 international flights and they're hauling medical supplies actually, they're going on long haul flights. So they've turned in to be our largest customer in the past 30 days. Next. We've um, taken a lot of different action um, and we're, we're continuously meeting uh, both with our team at our locations and having a lot of Zoom calls like this. Uh, I didn't know what Zoom was, hadn't touched it 40 days ago, and now I'm uh, getting a little bit proficient at it. Um, but we haven't laid anybody off. Uh, we're fortunate that we were able to participate in the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, like many businesses are taking advantage of that. So we're doing our best to just maintain all of our employees on a full-time basis. A lot of those non-essential people are um, working remotely and, and not from home. And uh, we're doing everything as Sean mentioned, you know, keeping things clean and uh, trying to um, make sure that we're, we're doing that on a more frequent basis, like everybody else is everywhere in the country. Um, we've also used this time to really look at some of our efficiencies in the company, doing a ton of training. Uh, when you think of our maintenance and our line personnel, we want to encourage them to take this slower period to really concentrate on improving the process and things that we have in place today. And we've also been able to really dig in deep to some of our data regarding our customers and clean all that up so that we can have more accurate information and respond better to our customers in the future. Next. Uh, just another little uh, stat here that I found was kind of interesting. The uh, looking back to 9-11. So 20 years ago, um, the commercial fleet, the airlines were grounded in this, all air, aircraft were grounded in the country for about three days. And that month, that decreased the traffic by 32%. And already in April, 
we've seen the United States traffic down by 75% over, you know, from last year. So this is really significant. It's a bigger deal um, and it's gonna take a little bit more uh, action and um, important, important decisions um, to recover from all this. On the next slide, we compare uh, the Great Recession of, of 10, 11 years, 12 years ago. Um, we suffered some of our lowest activity, uh, broke the records last month for lowest monthly flights, um, and the, that previous occurred during the recession of 2009. So we've already you know, sunk below those numbers. And as I've indicated, our, our April projections are gonna be even lower. An interesting uh, data point too is on Christmas Day is usually the slowest general aviation day in America, and there are only 3,100 flights in December, and we've already had 19 days this year with flights below. So there's clear evidence that you know act activity is down, and we're probably operating at about 25% of normal. Um, we've been fortunate. On the next slide, tells you about just the diver diversification of our business, and I think of my colleagues across the country and other FBOs. We're very fortunate to have several different areas of, of the business that can help support each other. So right now, fuel sales are way down, but I'll tell you that our maintenance shops are both working at capacity. We actually had customers and people call in and tell us about, you know, hey, if we're not gonna be flying for several weeks, now I wanna get my annual in, or I wanna do that upgrade that I've been talking about. So our, our maintenance shops have been bu busy. Uh, we do a lot of special mission aircraft work for aircraft around the world, and um, we're confident that we're gonna retain those uh, business and those contracts that, that are underway uh, to fulfill those certainly this year. And our weather modification business um, will we'll shift gears a little bit. I think we're gonna have to be a little more aggressive in what we do to attain those customers and clients, but we've got a lot of long-term uh, contracts underway that will keep us flowing through this slower period of time. So on the next slide, where we go from here, um, it's it's a challenging time and as i've indicated we've had you know these crisis periods uh two times uh in my career over the past 25 years and we're going to get through it um it's going to be a challenge uh so i think for students that are listening in i think the important part is you know consider how we've diversified our business you really need to diversify what you're doing and thinking about today you might have been focused on one particular aspect of aviation, and I think you need to look at everything. And it might be out of aviation right now or upon graduation for a short time. Really maintain and keep those contacts in the aviation industry, keep them hot and warm. Um, you have an incredible advantage as a UND student on that campus, regardless of whether you're in aviation or any other program, an unbelievable dedicated alumni network, and that stands even stronger uh, in the aerospace college. So those alumni and dedicated people uh, of the university are interested in your success in your career. So make those contacts, keep them, and especially in this time period, we're all willing to help out. Uh, I can't hire everybody today, but um, as things pick up, we will absolutely be hiring more talented aviation professionals. So um, be optimistic and um, don't, uh, don't get too frustrated right now. Um, especially for, for seniors, it's, it's a challenging time, but reach out. Uh, Sean gave some great points there on, on what to do right now, um, but we'll look forward to helping any of you in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. And you can all tell listening in why Jim was inducted into the Aviation Hall of Fame at the Odegaard School this past year. He's really been involved in just a myriad of things and it's exciting to watch. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, I think one of my favorite YouTube videos is loading, I think it's a Korean Air 747 combo on the north end of the Fargo airport full of cows that uh, the Fargo Jet Center uh, and the Fargo airport were involved in. So if you haven't YouTubed that video and time elapsed, it's really something to see. So um, and Jim, again, thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. Um, so next up is Kyle Warner. Uh, Kyle is the executive director of the North Dakota Aeronautics Commission, as you can see. And uh, Kyle's going to kind of talk about how the state 
uh, supports airports and what the state role is uh, going forward in aviation in this new time. Thank you, Dr. Kenville. Um, it's a privilege to be here with all of you um, this uh, afternoon. Um, great presentations by my colleagues. I appreciate all the information they were able to share. Um, a little background about me. Um, like I said previously, I was born and raised in North Dakota. Um, went to, I grew up in Mandan, North Dakota. Went to school at University of North Dakota, uh, originally to be an air traffic controller. And so my first two years at school, that was my focus. And uh, um, I realized, I, I think at the time, that it was a good idea to diversify uh, my education. And so I decided to step into the, the business world and get a degree in airport management as well. And I almost got my pilot's license. I was involved in a whole assortment of different um, aviation and regular just student organizations when I was at school, student government. I even ran for student body president at one point. Um, so I kept really busy, um, obviously tried to get good grades. I uh, spent my summers incredibly busy um, working to pay for school, hot tar roofing, uh, did an internship at an airport that was fueling planes at a fixed-based operator, uh, so I was putting in my time. Eventually, I, I graduated, and uh, like I said, I was, I was trying to be an air traffic controller. I scored 100 out of 100 on the ATSAT, the placement exam, and uh, after three years, I still wasn't hired as an air traffic controller, and so I was work, looking around for other opportunities, I was uh, eventually hired by the University of North Dakota Aerospace Foundation to work with the international flight students, um, and eventually uh, found uh, an application for uh, to be an airport planner with the state of North Dakota. There was a, a position that opened up, a planner who had been at the state for around 30 years um, had retired, and so I, I thought I'd throw my hat in the ring. Um, and here's uh, my first pro tip for you students out there. Make sure that you are paying attention and and being nice to your professors because someday they might end up uh, being on your interview panel. Because uh, Dr. Kenville was actually on the interview panel uh, when I applied to be uh, the airport planner for the state of North Dakota about uh, 10 years ago. Um, and so I was grateful for the opportunity to be uh, uh, introduced into the airport planning world. Um, fun fact as well, actually the day after I accepted the job to move to Bismarck uh, to be the state's airport planner, I actually got a call from the uh, FAA to, to uh, be an air traffic controller for the state of Michigan. They didn't tell me where in Michigan, but but uh, I was supposed to go down to training Oklahoma City and, and eventually uh, find a job in, in Michigan. And I actually turned that down because I had, I had already chosen a different path, even though I was, you know, the air traffic control was my primary uh, purpose at the time. I, I already made a decision to go a different path. And um, I'm from North Dakota. I love this great state and I want to do what I can to make the state a better place. Um, and so similar to what Sean was saying earlier, um, you know, sometimes we end up in places where we didn't expect. A lot of times it's, it's for the better, though. And so always maintain a positive attitude in that way. Um, but uh, three or four years after being a planner, um, I was uh, eventually um, promoted to be the executive director for the North Dakota Aeronautics Commission, which um, I'll get into a little bit more here on the next slide. Actually, let's go to the next slide um, right here so we can get into what, what the Aeronautics Commission is. Um, a lot of U.S. students are obviously very familiar with the Federal Avi Aviation Administration. Um, it's also important that you acknowledge that uh, when you get into the aviation industry and you get into the airport management world, um, that it's incredibly important that you develop a relationship with the state agency, the state aeronautics agency. Every state has a Department of Transportation, um, and, there, and there's always an aviation organizational element to the state um, as well. Um, in the state of North Dakota, we're actually privileged to be one of four states in the country that actually are our own entity. So I'm not, the North Dakota Aeronautics Commission is not a part of the Department of Transportation. Uh, in most states, it is. Um, and so in our state, I, I report directly to the governor's office. We, we uh, request a budget. I go in front of the legislature to request that budget. Um, and we work on aviation-related issues for the state of North Dakota as a separate entity. In a lot of states, you know, you go across the border to Minnesota, South Dakota, or even Montana, all three of those states um, have an aviation organization as a part of the Department of Transportation. Um, and so um, it's, it's important to develop a relationship with those, those state entities because uh, um, they really can be a, an, an ally, an asset uh, to your airport in the, in the long term. Uh, the picture on this slide is, is one of my favorites. It was taken about three or four months ago. Um, it's it's uh, the Aeronautics Commission staff. It's a staff of six. Uh, taking a picture with their governor and lieutenant governor 
Um, just an incredible group of individuals that work on a daily basis uh, to improve aviation in the state of North Dakota. And you can see the mission on our slide, which is essentially what I've been saying about this team. Um, next slide. So some agency functions. Um, something else I wanted to, to mention as well, um, our state agency um, is actually, um, uh, the governor actually appoints five members to be a part of a, of a commission that oversees the staff. And so um, I'm, I'm privileged to be able to work with Dr. Kenville, who also serves currently as the chair of the State Aeronautics Commission. So she was appointed by the governor to serve on that board that I, I work with um, um, on matters um, before the state of North Dakota in regards to uh, uh, the aviation system. Uh, but some functions that we do at the Aeronautics Commission, um, airport infrastructure grant funding. So we, um, this spring, we're planning on providing about $3.5 million in grant funding for airport infrastructure projects all around uh, the state. Um, that's one of our, our largest purposes is to work to try to find additional aid for airports. Uh, airport planning support. Uh, we actually have two airport planners on staff that work on a daily basis uh, with our airports around the state on, on airport layout plans, airport master plans. Uh, they conduct airport inspections. Um, you know, when you look at our airport system, we have 89 public use airports. Um, and really, there's probably about 10 of them that have paid managers. And so there's a lot of volunteers out there helping to maintain our system. And so uh, we at the state level want to be uh, there for those volunteers to give them the advice and uh, um, help that they need um, when they need it. Uh, we also provide aviation education promotion and funding to um, help to help support the next generation's um, um, uh, desire to want to go into aviation as a career. We work with the aviation high schools around the, the state, the aviation museums, the University of North Dakota. Um, we, we support um, a whole number of different programs, and we actually have some funding in place um, to get students to, to, to place them into um, an airport environment or, or an environment where they can see what different career options are available for them in, in this exciting field. Uh, we also update aviation publications and planning documents. Um, you know, you might might have seen our airport directory, which has uh, photos of all of our airports in the, in the state. Um, we also promote a passport program where pilots can fly all around the state and actually uh, stamp this book um, at each one of the airports. It's a little fun scavenger hunt uh, for, for pilots, uh, and they actually can get rewarded uh, at different levels. Um, if you go to every single public airport in the state, you can actually be uh, provided a, a leather jacket. And so there's a, there's a whole assortment of different uh, programs that our, our, our agency offers. Uh, we have a whole assortment of regulatory functions as well. Just like when you go to the, as a, a Department of Transportation, um, you need to go and, and register your, your car. Uh, you need a, sim a similar function with the state of North Dakota in regards to an aircraft. So we register aircraft, we license our aerial applicators, um, we license aircraft dealers, those are who are selling aircraft. Um, we also receive uh, a tax from the pur purchase price of aircraft and fuel tax. Those are our main revenue sources to conduct business in the state. Um, and uh, during uh, the COVID-19 um, outbreak, um, you know, I'm, I'm privileged to be a part of an organization where we were uh, able to uh, very quickly uh, telework from home. Um, all, of, all the functions of our agency are ongoing. We've been obviously introduced to this teleworking world and the Zoom and the, and the teleconference, but all of our functions are, are up and op operating. Um, moving forward, we're gonna have to conduct business a little bit differently. We still need to conduct airport inspections around the state at our general aviation airports. And so that we're gonna have to put in, into place uh, some different uh, methods as we go about doing certain things, but we, we're confident uh, that we're able to do that because we have an incredible team uh, working at the Aeronautics Commission. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is a, a drawing, a depiction of the North Dakota airport system. We have uh, 89 public use airports in the state. We have eight commercial service airports and 81 public use airports. And so at the Aeronautics Commission, we're, we're, you know, we're not an airport manager in the sense that we have one airport uh, that we're working on. We're actually working with all 89 of our airports at the same time, trying to provide them support and learn more about what their needs are. Uh, so we can help prioritize their needs into a statewide capital improvement plan to help promote those needs to the FAA and prioritize uh, an entire system of needs of an airport at the state level. Um, it's also important to understand how funding works at our airports. Um, you know, if, you know, if you've been in some of the airport classes, you'll understand or may have heard the term NIPIAS, National Plan of Integrated Airport Systems. Um, there are 54 airports in the NIPIAS in the state that are eligible to receive federal funding. 
which means that there are 35 that are not in the NIPIA. So 35 of our airports are solely reliant on state and local funding to uh, maintain um, their airport, uh, rebuild their runways, and maintain their operations. Uh, it's also important to note we have over 200 private airstrips uh, that exist throughout our state. Uh, some states around the country actually certify and inspect their private airstrips. We don't do that in North Dakota, but they are a, a, an important part of our airport system. Next slide, please. And so what are the revenue impacts that we're seeing at the state level? I mean, every state right now um, is, is seeing incredible impacts, whether it's sales tax revenue, um, income tax revenue in the state of North Dakota, oil tax revenue uh, is being impacted uh, in, a, in a huge way right now. Um, our agency, the Aeronautics Commission, um, we, we don't receive uh, much general fund dollars from, from the state coffers. Our main source of revenue um, are into a special fund. And as I mentioned previously, they're from aviation fuel taxes on eight cents a gallon and aircraft excise tax, of 5% of the purchase price of aircraft or 3% of its aerial applicator aircraft. And so, um, so most of our revenue comes from, from those areas. Um, looking back at our financial statements for the month of, month of March, we were actually 23% ahead of the projections um, at that point. Um, so our state and our revenue was, was, was um, surpassing expectations at that point. But obviously, in moving forward, we're going to see a huge impact. Um, you know, you heard what Jim and Sean were saying previously about the levels of activity. So we definitely expect pe less people to buy planes and less people to be uh, fueling their uh, buying fuel for their their flights as well. So we do expect to see impacts in that way. Um, the uh, the state oil revenue is is also a concern. The state had forecasted um, a a, a um, revenue coming from oil at $48 per barrel at $1.4 million per day. Um, yeah, just last week, oil was in the negatives even, and so it, it's going to be a, a difficult time for our state moving forward. Um, and all those areas uh, will essentially result in a, a, any loss of revenue could result in a reduction in state infrastructure aid for airports in future years. 75% uh, of the uh, expenditures of the aeronautics mission are actually for airport grants, and that's something we pride ourselves on. So as we receive uh, a, um, a tax revenue, um, we are doing whatever we can to make sure that that revenue gets back out to the communities uh, in the form of infrastructure projects to help build our airports up and create more jobs. And so um, those are the areas that will be impacted moving forward, but we don't necessarily see any impacts in the short term. Um, we still anticipate about three and a half million dollars of state aid to be provided this spring. So any, any revenue reductions will most likely impact future budgets. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a graphic that you can pull on the North Dakota State Treasurer's website. It shows the status of oil revenues uh, for the state of North Dakota. Um, essentially, it, one bucket fills and it goes into the next bucket, into the next bucket. Um, you can see on the bottom right hand, there's an airport infrastructure fund that can fill up to $20 million. Um, you know that's that's an incredible accomplishment that we were able to achieve last legislative session and and finding a long-term solution to the infrastructure needs in our state and so they actually came up with a plan to help um airports by diverting some oil revenue to a specific fund dedicated for airports uh that being said for that fund to fill all of the previous buckets to the left uh, need to be fully filled uh, prior to that so in early march we were actually probably about seven percent ahead of projections um, in, in the state for oil revenue. And so we were fully anticipating that that fund would fill up to $20 million next spring, uh, which we could then utilize to help airports all around the state. Um, obviously that at this time has most likely changed. And so um, we're gonna have to adapt to the situation um, as everybody else around the country um, at this time. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a, a graphic showing the airline destinations available to the state of North Dakota um, this past February. Um, in my opinion, I think this, this early March, February timeframe, we had the best air service in the state of North Dakota I think we had ever seen. Um, all of our eight commercial service airports had jet service. Uh, we were averaging 60 airline fl flight departures per day uh, with an estimated 1,400 available seats. Um, we had larger aircraft flying in our state than we've ever seen. We had great fares. Um, and so it was really sad to see that uh, COVID-19 directly impacted our communities as it has. I know Sean gave a great presentation showing the impacts that Fargo has seen, but uh, communities all around our state have seen, have seen similar impacts. Uh, next slide, please. 
which uh, brings us to this slide. So this slide shows a breakdown of the impact to all of our commercial service airports in North Dakota for the month of March. And you compare March 2020 versus March of 2019, uh, we saw a 40 to 43 percent drop um, statewide, uh, which is absolutely incredible. Um, prior to COVID-19 hitting, um, like I said pre on the previous slide, I was I was fully expecting 2020 to probably be a record-breaking year uh, for air service in the state of North Dakota. And so um, March was down over 40 percent. We expect April to be even worse. Um, we expect you know, 90 to 95 percent um, drop in, in our normal levels. Um, but, um, you know, we need to be optimistic that we can um, we can eventually get back to where we were previously. And I think we're going to want to use uh, the statistics from 2019 as a as a benchmark and moving forward to, to try to get our communities back to where we were and even stronger than they were before. Next slide, please. And so this is some interesting information I thought I'd share for those uh, airport management um, uh, students. Um, when, you, when recently I heard the consultants had done a survey uh, in the private industry, there there had been over 90% of, of companies that are experiencing delays or cancellation of projects around around the country. 72% uh, of companies have reported reductions in project advertisements, and 29% of of companies anticipate major challenges. And so this could seem like dire news, um, but with every um, a challenge comes an opportunity. And so, you know, from our state perspective, from an airport management perspective, when I see information like this, there may be an opportunity for, for projects to come in under budget if we're actually trying to move forward with projects. Um, you know, in the state of North Dakota specifically, um, if, if you were here last uh, summer, last fall, uh, it, was, it was the wettest um, construction season on record. And, uh, and so that, that had a huge impact on the construction work that was done last year and so a lot of work did not get done last year and we knew that there was going to be um, um, a, a price tag to that this spring as we bid projects so we were cons we were concerned that it was going to be um, difficult to get uh, uh, good prices on projects this year but now we're seeing that there's a lot more work to be had out there because of projects being canceled around the country next slide one of the things we also look at in North Dakota is a construction cost index. As time goes on, we have there's inflationary costs, um, construction costs rise, um, and it's really interesting to follow what's happening in North Dakota. It's been kind of a roller coaster, particularly because of the oil development in the western part of the state. If you look at 2014 and 2015, you can see that the uh, construction cost index was at the highest levels that it, it has ever been in our state, um, but it actually decreased in 16 and 17, which follows the, the the downturn that we had. So um, obviously with the, the lack of activity also came uh, better prices for construction. And so um, with what I just kind of showed in the last slide with the lack of work around the country and with oil dropping in North Dakota, um, you, one could look at this and say, hey, now is the opportunity, now is probably the time to get a, get work done at our airports and our highway system and, and, and different public infrastructure work because infrastructure is needed um, and now is probably the time to get a good price on those construction projects. Next slide. And so some silver linings, like I just said, project costs, what we're seeing, we're seeing about 10 to 15 percent um, lower project costs than expected right now in the state. We're opening a lot of bid, bids on projects um, right now. And so we did a good job in preparing our airports to have their projects to be able to bid um, early in the spring as early as possible so they can be ready for the construction season. So by being prepared, that allowed us to have an advantage in applying for grant funding uh, to, to, for, um, in regards to other airports or other states around the country. Um, an additional silver lining in what's been happening is that the federal government stepped up in a very big way by providing uh, CARES Act funding to airports all around the country. It was a $10 billion uh, aid bill uh, to the aviation industry and to airports, um, specifically in North Dakota. Our airports are eligible to receive up to $85 million in aid, uh, which can help with the salaries, operations, and in some cases, capital projects. And so we at the Aeronautics Commission are working uh, with all the uh, airports around the state and the FAA to, to ensure that those funds are being uh, applied for um, and utilized in the best ways possible. Um, and we know that airports are, are in a tough time, but this funding should do, uh, should help in a big way to help keep our airports um, afloat so that when the economy comes back, our airports are going to be there in a big way. 
It's also important to note that we expect and we have been hearing um, a lot of conversations about a, a potential infrastructure bill in the near future. Um, and we want our airports to have good plans in place and are prepared uh, with projects, good high priority projects, so that they may be able to benefit if additional funding comes forward for additional infrastructure um, funding, uh, which would help create uh, jobs um, for the, their communities and help you know, our airports and the rest of the industry catch up with the infrastructure needs that, that they have. Um, some additional thoughts. Um, I've been on a lot of conversations with, um, with our state uh, tourism department, um, and the things that they're hearing are that the fact that rural states will probably see a benefit uh, f from being a rural state and that uh, activity levels might be returning sooner than, than in other areas of the country. Uh, we have a lot of wide open spaces in North Dakota and safe leisure opportunities. And so for, for once that actually might be a, a silver lining uh, for our state. Um, we also uh, support uh, farming in a big way through our aerial applicators in the state. We, we license over 100 aerial applicators in the state of North Dakota. And uh, there's no reason that, that they can't uh, continue to proceed with, uh, with their activity uh, to help promote um, and spray on average about four to four and a half million acres for our, for our farmers. And so our airports are still gonna be able to support agricultural activity uh, in the state of North Dakota. Um, airports at this time are also uh, targeting projects uh, that are easier to com complete due to lower activity levels, um, whether it's airside or landside pavement maintenance, uh, or painting, you don't it's going to have a lower impact on operations because we have lower operations at this time. Um, whether that's doing ter specific terminal updates or deep cleaning activities, um, those are some things that airports are looking at. That hey, now is probably the time to get some of those projects done instead of you know when when it gets busier again. Um, next slide, please. Some additional take takeaways. Like I said before, good planning is absolutely critical. Um, it's important as an airport to be ready for. Uh, projects to occur when funding becomes available because you don't we just don't know um, in the uh, political situations that we're in whether on the federal state or local levels when funding becomes available so um, we need to have planning complete at an airport uh, we need to be able to have environmental clearance we need to have designs done we need to be able to go into a, a bidding environment and be successful and move forward on construction so there's a whole assortment of different um, areas of a project that we need to continue to work uh, well together on. So it's kind of important to understand those processes and how they work. Um, it's also important to take a look at this time and, and the fact that um, it's an opportunity. I mean, like I said, with every challenge comes a, an, an opportunity. And right now there's definitely an opportunity um, to provide leadership in a whole assortment of different areas, whether that could be a leadership opportunity in, 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 your, in your house, with your family, um, or, or in, in just um, developing those skill sets so you can be ready to apply for jobs in the future. Um, it's also an opportunity to take time for personal growth. Um, you know, one for me is personal humility um, and growing and that sometimes, you know, things are out of our control and that's life and we have to find a way to work through them. Um, and so along with that, um, we, we in the aviation industry continue to need to have the, the critical skill to adapt. And I know that's talked about probably all the time in, in your classes, um, aviation needs to be adaptable and flexible. Um, and so as, as a, a, a worker in this industry, you, you need to understand how technology works. You need to be a good communicator. Um, and you, you need to understand uh, how, priority, how to prioritize and how to plan uh, different items and, and how quickly those things can change. Um, and so working hard in those areas is, is absolutely critical. Um, and also building relationships is incredibly important during this time. Um, the, the, the better relationships that uh, people have built uh, when a situation like this happens, um, it's a lot easier to work together to get, get, to get out of that. Next slide, please. And so uh, in closing, um, airports are absolutely critical to the recovery of, of our, our economy and our country. Um, this graphic is from an economic impact study uh, that our, our agency conducted back in 2015, just showing all of the um, IFR traffic from different areas around the country into the state of North Dakota. And uh, our airport specifically provided a $1.6 billion annual impact on the state of North Dakota is what was determined back in, in 2015. And, uh, and so we know that our airports are going to be an absolutely critical part of uh, reopening our economy in, in our state and in the rest of the country. And so, um, so my message is like everybody to continue to be optimistic, 
Um, there, there's there's a, a place in this industry uh, for you if you work hard, um, and and don't give up. And um, I guess that's all I have, Dr. Kenville. If there's any questions, I can take those as well. Well, thank you, Kyle. Um, I really appreciate you um, sharing that that vision with our group today. And, and I wanna thank all of our panelists because I think you all bring a little bit different expertise to the table and a different message. And, and it's, it's exciting to hear how successful you've all been. Um, I think what's interesting is I think the three of you are probably working harder in this past three weeks. I don't wanna say than ever, but um, a lot of people are finding themselves at home with time and all of your jobs have now created far more effort, far more paperwork and far more meetings. Um, so I think, you know, again, when we have times of crisis, sometimes we have to dig in even further. Um, I'm just thinking about all that paperwork processing that's going to happen in the airport world. So I appreciate your efforts um, going forward for on behalf of all of us. Uh, the first question I have on Q&A, I think comes from someone that might know Sean a little bit better than I do. And this person is wondering if your work as a security officer with REO Speedwagon and the band Survivor may have helped you get that first security job at Hector International. No, no that, that, was, that was really, really brief. And just, just to tie there, I've got a cousin that uh, is a drummer for Survivor, but uh, that, was, that was a long time ago. But uh, okay. that was a lot of fun. Yeah. Just for a little while. Um, so a second serious question for Sean is I had a student ask me, uh, is there a magic number when an airline will cancel a flight? In the higher ed world, if we don't have five people in class or 10 people in class, the university will cancel the class on a revenue standpoint. Is there any magic number that the airlines have shared with you that would you would know a flight would cancel? No, they, they, they haven't shared it, but but I do know what, what goes into it. Obviously, our stage length uh, with the number of passengers, uh, the revenue that's associated, you know, from Fargo to Dallas as opposed to Fargo to Minneapolis, there, there's different uh, dynamics with, with the cost to operate that aircraft. But I think the DOT has given them a lot of flexibility in terms of combining as many flights as, as possible uh, to, to try and uh, take off some of the sting, if you will, for the lost revenue that they're having. But those metrics, I, I think, are different for each airline for, and for each route. All right, um, this question is for Jim. Uh, being that you've kind of, uh, I would guess over many years, amassed these different business segments within um, your companies, how do you decide uh, kind of which direction to go? I'm guessing one of them is up, one is down at different times, but how did you guys decide as a family which area to branch out into next? It's always uh, a, a challenging question on the direction where to assign resources and that's people and money and space. Um, you really have to listen to your customers, listen to the market, um, try to be, you know, in this current situation, we've been through this twice. So we know it's going to take time to recover. We're better positioned today than we were in the last two, just because of our growth and our diversity. Um, but it's, it's really trying to be a little bit, have that unique niche that you can fulfill a demand somewhere. We've grown our special mission aircraft modification business. So we have aircraft from virtually all continents come into Fargo um, to have certain specialized mod work done. So that's been a really fun, challenging, um, diversified part of our business. Uh, so the, the answer is just continue to look forward, see what's happening in the market. What are the new, you know, unmanned stuff, whatever that future thing might be and how can we leverage our talents and resources to be part of it. All right. Um, one segment uh, that's not often talked about that I'll ask Kyle is what if um, students are looking to get into state or federal, you know, kind of more of a government type job in aviation. Um, what do you see as possible avenues for that? Absolutely. Um, and, you know, when I was a student at the University of North Dakota, I I wasn't looking at a state job or a federal job. It was, you know, you're on that airport management track, but there's definitely a lot of opportunities out there, uh, whether it's, you know, working at one of the 50 uh, state governments out there or the Federal Avi Aviation Administration. And um, I, I say, you know, one of the best things you can do is to contact a, a state organization um, or even an airport district office and just get into some meetings and, and get, get into an opportunity where you can job shadow. There's a lot of internship opportunities out there. Um, even at the state of North Dakota, we offered an internship for the first time this, this, this upcoming summer, and we didn't really get very many applicants. 
Um, there's also airport internships all around uh, in the state of North Dakota at the Aeronautics Mission. We actually helped to, to fund uh, airport internship um, um, jobs at the commercial service airports. And so you got to get your foot in the door um, is, the, is the first place. But, you know, knowing that those jobs are available uh, is the other one, too. And so there, there's a lot of tracks out there for aviation careers. Um, airport planning, there's airport planning uh, consultants. And, and I'll tell you what, when I talk with people in the industry, um, they're looking for good airport planners. Um, and there's a lot of um, interest in that area. So if that's something that you're, you're interested in. There's definitely opportunities out there to, to find jobs. So Kyle, you mentioned that planning was critical. And so since basically we have three CEOs on the line here and you've all, you know, been through a couple of ups and downs. How do you, in the planning of your finances and your projects and your acquisitions, how do you plan for this sort of rainy day? I get that we didn't plan for the graph to absolutely drop off, um, but how do you kind of plan in the back of your head for this rainy day? And I'll start with Sean to answer, um, you know, in terms of if I need to have money set aside because things could downturn. We do. We're, we're very fortunate here in Fargo that, you know, we, we spend what we need and save what we can. And uh, we have put a, a, away um, some money into reserves. We do not have any debt uh, here in Fargo. So we're not, we're not paying for an empty parking garage or paying for other debt uh, for uh, any airfield improvements that we've done. So we've, we've planned for that. But the COVID situation right now is I'm projecting that we're, we're going to lose between parking and car rental alone. We're going to lose over $450,000 a month in revenue for the next number of months. So thankfully, as Kyle had mentioned, uh, we were fortunate that we're going to get a CARES grant for a little over $21.6 I signed the application for that yesterday, and I'm waiting for the grant offer to come hopefully tomorrow or maybe Monday. We're going to use that for operational expenses. And uh, we, we have to spend the funds or they're eligible to spend the funds for up to four years. So starting from like January 20th of 2020 through January 19th of 2024, we'll be able to draw down operational expenses from that, that grant to offset the losses in revenue that we're going to have from primarily parking and, and car rental, which are the largest revenue generators at airports across the country. Uh, so, so that will help from there but like you say as far as planning we are still moving forward with projects here in Fargo a cargo apron expansion for UPS uh, we, we awarded bids to um, uh, expand our snow removal equipment building as I said earlier in my presentation um, they came in under budget uh, which was good for us um, uh, so we're going to expand that we're going to do a reconstruction project of one of our car rental parking lots we're going to completely remove and, and repaint most of the airfield markings uh, so we're still going to move forward with our projects here in Fargo but like you say, we, we started to budget for those a number of years ago uh, because we do have limited funds through the airport improvement program and discretionary funds. And we're thankful for the funds that we do get from the state. But like you say, as a state, uh, there's, there's a much higher need for funding at all airports across the state than what's, what's able to be provided. But we do appreciate that support from the state as well. So it all comes into planning, uh, living within your means, hopefully, and not going out and borrowing a whole bunch of money, which, which a lot of your airports at this time um, that have a lot of debt uh, didn't come out so well in the CARES funding that came out. And uh, that's a whole nother topic for discussion. So Jim, uh, Sean represents more of a public agency and Kyle does too, and you represent a private one. Um, and so not that it's coming out of your back pocket, but literally. So how do you guys, uh, your family plan for these kind of events? Yeah, it's, it's a real challenge. Um, but I, I'll echo what Sean said. The, um, partnership we have with both the airport authority and and how the state and Kyle's office really contributes to what happens here at Hector International Airport is very important to us and and our decisions on where how we invest and where we invest and how we do that is directly related to the support that we get from those good organizations and as I mentioned before it's it, we were so fortunate in North Dakota to have the system and the process that we do at the state and local level um, it helps us make decisions because we can count on them to make the right decisions as we move forward. Uh, it's challenging. We have debt. Uh, we're a small business. We're entrepreneurs. We're always trying to decide and prioritize where we're going to spend money and how we're going to do it. And we've, we're in a growth mode right now. So we're trying to um, buy more aircraft and expand our hangars and grow our employee base. And that's going to just have a, a little bit of a slowdown. 
Um, but we're optimistic with the future and the business that we have in the pipeline um, that we're going to, you know, we'll, it'll, it'll plateau out a little bit, but then uh, continue to grow in the future. Thanks, Jim. And Kyle, I know that our budget at the state is fairly set and we are dependent upon the funds that come in through aviation activities. Uh, can you speak a little bit to how you kind of plan for these financial bumps in the road? Well, absolutely. When we budget at the state level, you know, we work with the state legislature and the governor's office to come up with a good plan. And we, we do a very good job in, in understanding, you know, what we have in our current special fund. And uh, we do a good job in, in projecting what our revenue is going to be in the future and, and in, in budgeting what the dollar amounts are needed in each area of, of what our operation is. And, uh, and so we're in a situation right now where I'm, I'm pretty confident we can provide the amount of funding that we expected to provide this by any amount to the airports. Um, and we're doing the best we can to work with airports to diversify their revenue streams as much as possible, um, especially the general aviation airports, whether that's, you know, fuel sales, land leases, hangar rent. Um, you know, a lot of these general aviation airports don't, I mean, they obviously don't have the, the passenger traffic that the commercial service airports do, but we work with them to try to do the best we can, they can to diversify that revenue. But like what, what Sean was saying earlier, I mean, when we plan at the state level to do projects, and we involve federal funding, state funding, local funding to get these projects done, um, we're very smart about it, very strategic. Um, and we, we don't do projects that, um, you know, one, don't make sense that we don't need. Um, but, but two, we, we don't um, overburden the financial system. So we're not putting airports in an, an incredible amount of debt to, to get projects moved along. Um, in some cases, we need to wait a, a year or two before a certain project can occur. And those are the de strategic decisions that we make at, at the federal and state level when we're looking at, to fund projects. And so I, I believe we really have done a good job in the state of North Dakota. Each individual airport is in a, in a relatively good financial position. Every airport is different, but I, I think in North Dakota, we have a conservative leadership, conservative financial uh, style at the local level and even at the state level. So um, like Sean said, a lot of airports are currently benefiting from the CARES Act because um, they, ha they don't have a large amount of debt. Um, and so we may be able to come out of this stronger than we were prior, which is something a lot of people say, but I, I actually really do believe that a lot of airports can come out stronger because of, of how strong we were prior uh, to COVID-19 hitting. Thanks, Kyle. So I have one last question before we wrap it up. We had a question come in for Jim. Um, this uh, person was wondering how line operations has changed when handling a flight regards to COVID, especially you were talking about those international flights. So, you know, what's different in the way you would deal with a flight um, that's coming in from overseas or might be going overseas? Uh, thanks. We've had a few uh, international arrivals in the past few weeks, so obviously down a lot from, from normal, but um, just, you know, handling all that protocol a little bit closer, you know, making sure that we're distancing ourselves. Um, it, the crews and the passengers have been extremely cooperative in letting them come in if they do come in, uh, give them their space. Uh, and handling bags and things a little bit differently. So providing protective equipment to our people if they desire to wear that. Um, so it's, it's a challenge, but the, the fact is there's just been so few traffic, you know, few uh, aircraft operations that um, they're able to do it in a safe and good manner. Thank you. So at this time, we're going to wrap up and I want to tell you gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I know that you could have easily said no, that you were too busy. You don't want to put together a presentation. And again, when we reached out to you, you guys were more than happy to jump on board and, and join our speaker series. Um, so just to remind everybody that this is going to be available on our UND Aerospace YouTube channel. Um, so, you know, you can just pump it out nationally <laughs> if you want to. I really want to thank the Dean's Office for setting all of this up and, and Associate Dean uh, Beth Bierke for um, uh, helping moderate these sessions and pushing out the advertising for this. So, again, there's no way to really applause over Zoom. We should have some sort of audio applause. I know you can like actually do a thumbs up and stuff, but I don't know how to do that. But thanks again, guys, and I really, really appreciate it. And Hopefully the people listening got a little more perspective on airports um, in the aviation industry. So we'll all pray for better days ahead and uh, that we get through this fast. Thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you.